I'm honored to be here and to discuss the curricular reform at school level, but from the point of view of the country and uh, the access to quality education. So for this closing event, uh, as you, you know, we have been talking for decades about a bright future in education. Uh, there is always this next big thing. It could be to start with students' interests. It could be constructivism. It could be always teaching context. It could be social emotional learning. It could be critical thinking, uh, 21st century skills. And all these things uh, take a role. All these things, the students' interests are interesting. Uh, constructivism, not as a philosophy, but constructivism as a way of enticing students to understand things makes some sense, although uh, I'm not a constructivist. Um, to have some context, to have some social emotional support, to develop critical thinking, all these things make some sense, but they are not going to solve the problem of education in our countries. Then we have inquiry based learning, project based learning, competence and not knowledge, and now things start not making sense to me because to develop competence and not knowledge doesn't make sense. We should develop application of knowledge, of course. But this needs knowledge. So uh, there is a, a big discussion here, and maybe I'll take one minute or so to, to explain my point of view. Well, my point of view first is that competence is, is not a good word because competence is for some people is just everything. It's a set of beliefs, of knowledge, of <coughs> procedure, <coughs> pardon me, of procedures, of skills. It's a set of things. So to talk about competences in this sense doesn't make sense to talk about competence and not knowledge because knowledge is inside it. So most of the time, although there is this confusion, what people mean when they are talking about competence and not knowledge, what they mean is skills and not knowledge. Although I believe that skills should be developed at the same time as knowledge. And then the question is not competence and not knowledge or skills and not knowledge. The question is, how are we going to organize a curriculum? And now it depends. If you are a vet, if you are doing professional training for some skill, suppose photography, you develop your course around the skill to be able to take good photographs. It's the same thing for other professions. But when you are talking about school in general, it doesn't make sense to me to develop school in terms of skills. The structure of thinking is the structure of disciplines. It's the structure of mathematics. It's the structure of physics, of history, all this. Yeah, yes. So we are, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, we are going to organize our curriculum totally in terms of skills because skills are things that appear here and there deriving from knowledge and knowledge is a thing that has to be structured. So you can't develop, for instance, uh, a course in history for um, middle school students around the skills in history. You have to give them some background knowledge, some knowledge about history and this is a structure of a curriculum. This is structured around knowledge. It's not structured about, about competencies or about skills. And same thing for mathematics and so on. So let's move on. Now, multiple intelligence. Now we are talking about things that here really don't have any scientific support, learning styles even less, and so on. So we have been talking about all these things and they don't solve the problems in school. And as you know, in Europe, the situation is not right. So what shall we do? I think that we should pay attention to the fundamentals. This is so simple, this idea. Pay attention to the fundamentals. Pay attention to reading, for instance. Pay attention to basic ideas about history. Pay attention to uh, maybe English, if you want to learn English, and I think it's all, always good to learn English. History, same thing. So let's pay attention to the fundamentals because our schools are not succeeding as they should in terms of fundamentals. We know that the rate of illiteracy in 
Europe in general, as measured by PISA, is something about, I'm talking about reading literacy, is something around 20% in Europe. So one fifth of 15 year old students in Europe are not able to read basic things. So this is a fundamental thing. We should look at this because if we don't solve this, then these 20% of students will stay forever limited in their future. And the situation he, here that we have is that failing is not an option. And I think that uh, you as experts in Slovakia education, you don't want to fail. You want to move things in a other direction. You want to make things succeed. So let me um, tell a couple of things about international data in the experience. Now we know, and this has been discussed in, in a couple of times, in a couple of meetings I've been with you, that the countries progress faster when they have an ambitious and well-structured curriculum. I'd say these two things. The curriculum has to be ambitious, is to impart knowledge, to impart skills, to impart attitudes, everything to the students, but not at a very basic level. We have to be ambitious. Our students should know more and should be able to do more. And structured. If it's not structured, no one understands things. So things have to be structured, have to make sense, because that's the way we humans work. We under, when we understand, things make sense. But at the same time, the international data and the experience have been showing that struggling students have to be have to have to have additional help because if we don't have additional help to them um, if we don't provide this additional help to them they will not succeed and this will be really uh, very 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 um, worrisome for us so we want students that are failing to not fail and in general i would say there are two attitudes for this one attitude is just to lower the standards and say, okay, um, they are not prepared, they can't work uh, at this level, so let's um, test them, let's um, avoid exams, let's avoid tests, let's just make things simpler for them. I think this is a big mistake, because if you do this way, not only the students, these students that need additional help, are not getting the additional help and they are still failing. We are just masking their failing. We are just pretending that they are not failing. But all other students will suffer from this. So the solution is not simplified curriculum or to simplify things since we are having students that are not able to, to follow the to follow the general e curriculum we want. The, addition, the solution is to give them extra support, and there are many ways of doing it. And <clears throat> I think this is something that people have to consider at all time. Now, if you use science, we know that well-structured teaching works better for students. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it's very surprising for some people that when we look at PISA data, PISA is showing that this is PISA 2015, and of course, you, the re references are there. So this is a graph from PISA. And what PISA shows is that students progress faster and better when they have structured teaching. And this can be shown here in a couple of things. In a couple, if you look, for instance, there, of course, the index of adaptive instruction. So the way that a teacher is able to adapt things to the students and respond to the students in instead of just lecturing, not thinking about students. So adapt in the sense that understand what that student's difficulties and then help them to reach the curricular goals. This is very important. And this comes as one of the most fundamental things in education for success of uh, education. Then uh, index of teacher directed attention. Uh, the index of teacher directed we are always uh, hearing about student, student-centered teaching and so on. And again, it's one of those things that no one really understands what it means because it means different things to different people. But the index of teacher-directed instruction is a major factor, factor 
in succeeding for students. This is what PISA data says. So when we look at PISA data carefully and not only at what sometimes some people say, we look that we see this. Then stud students, um, the index of inquired based instruction on bottom, so the fifth from bottom, the arrows are not exactly aligned with, with it, is one of the most negative factors here. This is very surprising because we have always been hearing that inquiry based instruction is the way to go. But look, PISA says, as PISA, PISA data tells us it's not exactly that. And other graphs from PISA say the same thing. It's very important that teacher explains how an idea can be applied, that teacher directs things, that teacher explains the relevance of science. But it's negative when students are asked just to do the investigation they want to do, and when they are allowed to design their own experiments, this is negative. So this is data that we should pay attention to. Uh, studies in cognitive psychology, in memory, attention, comprehension, and so on, and cognitive load theory, which is a very important theory for, for us, um, is, say, is saying the same thing. He's saying that we should organize and, stu and direct student studies. What does not mean? To beat students up. What does not mean not pay attention to their questions? What does not mean not pay attention to their interests? No, it means that we should, as the good teachers are with the class, trying to improve their knowledge and skills, being there, but having a goal, and the goal is the curriculum. So I think this is very important, and this is something that we should um, consider all the time. Now, on top of these three things, so ambitious and well-structured curriculum, I'm sorry for insisting with this because these points are really very important, I think. Additional help for struggling students and well-structured teaching. Also, what, something that comes from cognitive psychology is that domain-based knowledge is key. So you want, for instance, to have your students, and you should want, I think, sorry to say things this way, you should work, you should you should want your students to be to have some critical thinking about history you cannot develop critical thinking like a, a separate muscle of the brain um, you have to give them domain knowledge about history no one can have a critical thinking about history if doesn't know what uh, he or she is talking about so domain based knowledge is key and this is something that has been demonstrated over and over again by many experiments in cognitive psychology. And other thing that is has been developed very recently in, in science uh, is this assessment is key for progress. And let me make a parenthesis here because I think really that assessment is something very important for us. Sometimes people say, oh, we shouldn't assess we should do tests, we should do exams, because it's not with exams, it's not with assessment that they learn. Well, it sounds okay, but simply it's not true. It's not true. What many experiences that have been done from the beginning of this century, so beginning of 21st century up to now, especially by Rudiger and uh, Kerpike and other uh, psychologists, they have established, nowadays it's one of the most well-established things in education, if there are things well-established, but this is one of the most well-established, is that when we test, we learn. So, for instance, a student is reading a book, and the best way uh, to study the book, suppose it's a book, books are not out of fashion, books are important. So, a student is reading a book, and the best way to study the book is not to read it again. Because when we read it again, we have something that is called the illusion of knowledge. Because we go to a theorem or we go to a description of a war or something, and you go there and see, oh, I read this, okay, I read this, I've seen this. Because the student has read this before and goes and thinks at the end, rereading is he or she thinks, oh, um, I'm well prepared, I know everything. No, that's not the best way to study. The best way to study is to be tested or test yourselves, because when you test yourself, this is called retrieval, when you test yourself, you put your brain working, and the things in your brain that are like 
behind that are hidden go back and forth, you think about it, and you reinforce your knowledge or skills, if there are procedural skills, about the subject. So, one way that modern science, I'm talking about 21st century science, although in the 20th century there were already studies about this, but this is mainly our century science, is that assessment is key. And there is something called formative assessment here. Now let's go, let's jump and let's talk about PISA. And let's talk at the macro level because this is at the level of a student, of a class. And so what science is showing us is that the test should have formative assessment, should have tests, should students should have questions, should be have work and so on. If we jump to PISA, a couple of studies from around 2006 and now very recently in 2010. 20, if I'm not forgotten, have shown, looking at countries with this uh, window that we now have, because now we have data for many countries, many or many years from PISA for teams and, and so on. And it has been showing that once a country introduces some assessment, that country improves in results. And once a country eliminates some assessment, that country uh, re recesses, so that country re goes uh, goes down. So this is a macro level. Macro. This is well established now, and um, this is something that is very interesting. So in a way, this is showing that standardized assessment is key. So nation level assessment or regional level assessment is key. And my point of view is that all these things go together. Because if we have regional assessment or nationwide assessment, whatever you, you, a country decides to do, then you entice your you you give a you give a point of reference to all your teachers and students, and you entice teachers and students to reach the, those levels. And so, formative assessment, this thing that students do every day and that uh, students do and then uh, that teachers do, these things is reinforced if we have another level of, of uh, high stakes or mid stakes, middle stakes assessment standardized at the national or regional level. So assessment, science is showing that unlike what we thought last century, that it was useless, that it was to good, develop stress in students, that it's not good for the country. No, it's good for a country. It's good for the results of a country. It's good for the results of the students. But let me so go back to the curriculum because we can't assess if we don't have a good curriculum. And so curriculum is really a key here. And I told you my point of view, demanding curriculum centered on the essential subjects. So many countries have curricula that have everything that in the curriculum, so many things there that people are dispersed with many things. So some traditional subjects are absolutely necessary. History, geography, mathematics, literature, reading, all these things are really important sciences, arts. And so we have to be centered on these special things and have detailed standards. Because if we just say, oh, people should have, students should have an idea about what World War I was. Well, this is nothing. An idea for one teacher is just telling them when it started, when it ended, for another teacher could be something much more detailed, could be the history of uh, the fights, uh, the economic reasons and everything, the development of the, the consequences of the World War. So we need to have some detailed standards. It's not just to tell that things should be studied. And with knowledge at the base, as I, as I, I said, I think that we have to develop skills, we have to de develop knowledge, but the structure is around knowledge, not around skills. Then assessment, and this formative and summative assessment, they complement each other, they compare things, they reinforce each other, because they are an incentive. And then, what I've told you is a program to fight failure. This is very important that this is well established, I think, at this, uh, a national level, that we have intervention at first difficulty, so if a student has trouble with basic reading, we should uh, 
immediately. So it's it's to do immediately to to help this student. Uh, maybe with special hours. Maybe put aside some time for helping these students. Maybe with temporary groupings. I'm not saying tracking in, or or streaming in, in the American or English sense that a student students that know more go to one direction and students that know less go to another direction. In the elementary and middle schooling, this doesn't make any sense, I think, but temporarily help them because everybody can reach a reasonable level. Now, school autonomy is very important here. Um, you should somehow, I think, give incentives to schools, but incentives based on progress. And the major question here, from my point of view, is this. In order to give autonomy to schools, you have to have goals to schools and you have to have assessment. Because if you only have assessment and don't have autonomy, or if you only have autonomy and don't have assessment, then things don't work. So incentives to school based on the progress is the school do, but for that you have to assess schools. And what does it mean to assess schools? It assess students' progress. And that's why it's very important to have nationwide st standardized testing. So this is the way to go because evaluating results, you give freedom to schools. You tell schools, well, the schools should progress in this direction. This is the curriculum. These are the assessments. And now do as you want, but show us progress. And this is, I think, the best way to go and not go to schools and measure, go to each school, send lots of inspectors, try to tell them what to do. Uh, I don't know, but many times schools and teachers know what to do very well. We, as counselors or as uh, sometimes <laughs> believe they don't, but they, they know, they know. And then, of course, I think that at a higher level, so at high school level, there are vocational paths. This is very important also for helping these students from start to finish. So there is some thinking here. I think I have, I have, um, like five or ten minutes. Correct. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So let me, let me talk about something that we di I didn't talk yet, and I think it's very important for the curriculum. And that thing are textbooks. When I mean textbooks, I don't mean textbooks in the sense of the 19th century or something like that. I mean modern textbooks that have uh, links uh, to the web, that have uh, videos in incorporated or link it, that has modern textbooks, but textbooks. Textbooks are a great invention. And in the 21st, in the 20th century, they are still needed, I believe. I don't know about what's going to happen 50 years from now. I don't know, but I know what's happening now. And I know that nowadays in schools, when schools have support for uh, teaching, they work better. And you are, if I understand it well, you are revamping your curriculum, you are trying to make your curriculum more modern, better structured. But how is this going to happen in practice in schools? And we know from lots of studies that Textbooks are what directly uh, tell teachers what to do because teachers are not going to, to read the curricula. They are not going to read or sometimes they read, but most times they don't read. Uh, they don't read curriculum. They don't need the program. They don't read the pro curricular programs, but they have textbooks. So teams, for instance, teams um, studies have shown that textbooks dictate uh, or at least suggest or orient what teachers do. And uh, very important studies after team by Schmidt and Moody's and others shows that there is a big correlation between what textbooks have and what teachers do. And have shown also that countries with uh, good textbooks progress better. Now, uh, PISA studies have also shown that textbooks improve all, um, all teachers. So, not only weak teachers. Of course, 
if a teacher is not as well prepared as we would like him or her to be, the textbook is much more needed. So textbooks are needed when teachers are struggling with the, with the materials. But all teachers, even the experienced teachers, benefit from the existing from the existence of a good textbook. And don't forget, a good textbook is something that is really hard to do. It needs teams of people, experts on the subject, experts in the subject, um, teachers, uh, academics. It needs lots of people. And then it goes through the various, various processes. It's revised, it's published, then it's corrected because the, there are some mistakes that are corrected, that are noticed and corrected. So textbooks are really something that when they are well done, are very powerful. And of course, weak teachers benefit more. And as teachers get more and more experience, they can depart a little bit from the textbooks and they can do things slightly different, but they all, and this is the, the, what PISA studies have shown, they all benefit. Even the experienced teachers benefit from, from uh, textbooks. There was an interesting study by Ivik and other, other uh, probably you know this study because it's, uh, I think it's from a neighboring country uh, or for experts from a neighboring country uh, that uh, no improvement is like the improvement that textbooks can, can give. So when a country is struggling to improve, textbooks are really an important thing for, for the teachers and for the country to improve. So this has been studied in various countries. And it has also been shown that good textbooks and bad textbooks are different. So, you know, you know not, not only you should have textbooks, we should have good textbooks. Now, this is something that I, I suggest you discuss uh, because I suggest you pay lots of attention to this because many countries, when they are doing this type of change, they need textbooks. They need more than ever good textbooks. And so some system for improving textbooks, for assessing textbooks, for certifying textbooks, whatever, there are many ways of doing it, but some system is really needed. Otherwise, uh, the, the textbooks don't help as they should. And essentially, this is it. Uh, that's my, uh, I hope not having, got, not having taken too much of your time. And thank you very much.